Hello and welcome once again to What's Out There, the paranormal podcast from the Out There Paranormal Group. And telling tales on this episode is myself, Nigel. On my lonesome again, I know, it's so very sad, but Juliet will be back with me again for the next episode. So, here I am, talking about a topic that has recently appeared on our paranormal radar. I like to read... In fact, I read an awful lot. Of course, I'm talking actual books here. For me, there's nothing quite like sitting quietly with a cup of coffee and getting lost in the pages of the book. I read anything and everything, fact or fiction. I really don't mind. Just recently, I have taken a bit of interest in an author my lovely wife particularly enjoys reading. The author in question is a lady called Ellie Griffiths. Maria, my wife, suggested that I might like to read a couple of her books, as she says in her own words. They mention some of that weird stuff you enjoy talking about. I tentatively inquire about the genre of the books, as Maria does enjoy romantic fiction, quite what she's doing married to me, I'm not too sure, because romantic is not exactly my middle name. Anyway, it turns out that I'm on safe ground because they're crime novels, and as an added bonus, they are set in Norfolk. One of the lead characters is a forensic archaeologist who gets called on by the police whenever they come across human bones. Each book has an additional twist that relates to old Norfolk folklore and spooky tales. This has been the reason why my wife thought I might like to read them. Taking my wife's advice, I decided to have a look and read one of these books. So I did. And this is where the old paranormal radar began to ping because the last one I read was entitled The Lantern Men, and I felt perhaps we could dig a little deeper into this particular Norfolk tale. It's a pleasant, if slightly chilly, August evening at Thirlton Stave on the River Yare in Norfolk. Joseph Bexfield, a wherryman, had spent a busy day up and down the waterways dropping off cargo, finishing up on board his wherry, he was looking forwards to a drink or two in the White Horse Inn, just across the marsh with the rest of the crew. With the wherry safely moored, the crew made their way across the marsh to the welcoming inn in the distance. The light was beginning to fade and the mist was beginning to rise over the muddy pools. Joseph walked back from the bar, another rum toddy in his hand. Rejoining his crewmates at the table, they continued to chat, laughing loudly at each other's jokes. One of them mentioned his wife, and he suddenly remembered that he left a package behind on the boat. It was something his wife had asked him to buy in Norwich. Knowing how important the package was for his wife, Joseph decided to go back and collect it. He told his friends he was heading back to the boat to retrieve the parcel before walking to his house where his wife and two children were waiting. His friends pleaded with him to reconsider. It's way too dark now, Joe. Don't risk it. The lantern men are about. They had seen the glowing lights off in the distance as they crossed the marsh to the inn. Laughing at the stories, he pointed out how well he knew the marshes near his home. Just before the inn door closed behind him, a friend made one last attempt to persuade him to stay in the snug safety of the bar. But Joseph just held up his lamp and said he would be fine as it would light his way. Striking his lantern alight, he then headed off purposefully into the enveloping darkness. It was the last time he was seen alive. Holding his lantern out to light his way, Joseph began to realise that his friends had been right. It was pitch black around him and rather cold. Swirling patches of ground mist had made his job even harder. He stumbles in the dark, dropping his lantern, and its pale light is extinguished. Joseph gropes about trying to find it to no avail. 
He stands up and tries to get his bearings, thinking the best thing he can do is to return to the white horse. Peering into the inky darkness, he spots a light off in the distance ahead of him. Breathing a sigh of relief, he starts to head towards the distant light, thinking it must be the White Horse Inn. Joseph had forgotten the warnings from his crewmates, and as he walked towards the light, slowly disappeared. By now, he's totally lost out on the marsh. In desperation, he looks around again. There it is, the light he saw before. A little hazy, but it's there, beckoning him to come over. Picking up his pace, he starts off towards the light again. It was another three days before poor Joseph's body was discovered, washed up by the River Yare between Reedham and Brayton. If you take a trip to Thirlton and visit All Saints Church, there on the north side of the churchyard, you can find the grave of Joseph Bexfield. The tombstone is decorated with a picture of a wherry and tells of Joseph's death by drowning on August 11th, 1809. He was just 38 years old and he left behind a widow and two children. There is no warning, however, to beware of the lantern men, for it is they that led him to his watery grave. However, the story does not end here, for the ghost of Joseph Bexfield may still be seen, a sad shadow, wandering over the marshes on misty nights. And if you look and listen very carefully, you may see him stop to try and light his lantern, or even hear him give a nervous whistle before he disappears once more into the darkness. So, just who or what are these mysterious lantern men? The lantern man or jack-o'-lantern is the East Anglian name for the mysterious glowing balls of light that lead travellers from well-trodden paths into the dangerous marshes. To stay safe, it's important to follow some very specific advice. Pale lights that flicker in the darkness. That's the first sign that the lantern men are abroad. If you looked carefully into the pale light, you would see that it came from a lantern held by a shadowy little figure. However, looking closely into the light is very dangerous, as the lantern men would attack you, treading you down or swallowing you up. If you were too far away for them to reach you, they would try to lure you to their lights to entice you off the paths into thick mud and water to drown. The marsh men and wherry men of Norfolk knew that the lantern men led people to their deaths in the dark and dusk. To survive an encounter, it was important that you remember a few basic principles. Never carry a lantern or a torch. This mistake could cost you your life as the lantern men are attracted to the light. However scared you may be, never whistle. This attracts the lantern man and he will always run towards a whistle and kill you if he was able to. If caught in their light, hold your breath. The lantern men were able to take a man's breath away. Advice given by one old man was that if the lantern man is upon you, throw yourself flat on your face and stop breathing sound advice indeed. Of course, there is more than one tale relating to the Lantern Men, so let's journey over towards Alderfen Broad and listen to another tale.
In Norfolk, there used to be a 19th century wise woman by the name of Mrs. Lubbock, who lived in Ersted near Neatishead. According to her, Will o' the Wisp, or Jack O' Lantern if you prefer, was often seen to be walking around her village. Mrs. Lubbock tells a tale of a spirit of a man named Jack Hurd, who turned into a lantern man and was frequently seen in and around her village on a misty night, particularly at a spot called Hurd's Hole at Alderfen Broad. We are told that it was there that a man of that name, who was guilty of many terrible crimes, drowned in the peat-stained water. Afterwards, on some nights, strange dancing lights were seen rising and twisting over the marshes like candle flames. The locals who saw these lights thought it was a restless spirit of Jack Hurd. Mrs Lubbock said, and don't worry, I will spare you. <laughs> I'm not going to attempt to do an impersonation of a 19th century wise woman from Norfolk. Where's Juliet when I really need her? Anyway, Mrs Lubbock said, I have often seen it there, rising up and falling and twisting about, and then up again. It looked exactly like a candle in a lantern. If anyone were walking along the road with a lantern at the time, when Jack appeared and did not put out the light, he could come against it and dash it to pieces. And that a gentleman who made a mock of him and called him Will of the Wisp was riding on horseback one evening in the adjoining parish of Horning, when he, Jack, came at him and knocked him off his horse. There were many occasions when Jack sided up to the locals and scared the living daylights out of them. In fact, it got so bad that local folk were keen to lay Herd's spirit to rest and went looking for him in the places frequented by Herd when he was alive. Three men in particular tried to exorcise the ghost by reading verses from the scriptures, but Jack always kept a verse ahead of them. Until, that is, a boy brought a pair of pigeons and laid them down at the apparition's feet. Jack looked down at those birds and lost his verse, the one opportunity for those three men to bind his spirit and put an end to the mysterious lights. Perhaps we should add pigeons to our collection of paranormal kit. The Lantern Man is just one of the many names for these elusive natural phenomena. In other parts of the country, this mysterious cold fire has other names. Peg a Lantern in Lancashire, Joan the Wad in Cornwall, Hinky Punk in Somerset and Devon, Will the Smith in Shropshire, and Jenny with the Lantern in Northumberland. In fact, these strange lights are seen all over the world, and there are many stories attached to them. In Scandinavia, the lights are said to be the souls of unbaptized children. In America, they are spook lights or ghost lights. In Louisiana, a feu fillet from the French from Fool's Fire is a soul sent back from the dead, usually hell-bent on vengeance. In South America, they are called Liz Malar, evil lights, or La Candilaha. Chirabati, ghost lights, is the name given to strange dancing lights seen on the Bani grasslands in India. And in Australia, Min Min lights are often reported glowing in the outback. In fact, Ignis Fatus, or foolish fire, is a real phenomenon a pale, flickering flame that hovers above a marsh dark, still water for a few moments before dissipating into the night. Now, are you ready, folks, because here comes the science bit. The water in marshland is stagnant and oxygen-deprived. This creates the perfect environment for anaerobic bacteria to thrive. Now, many of these bacteria and microorganisms belong to a group known as methanogens. These methanogens just love to feast on dead plant matter. And as they break it down, one of the side products they generate is methane gas. When methane forms in anaerobic environments, it can get trapped underwater, only to be released by a physical disturbance. As these methanogens produce the highly flammable gas, they fill up the bogs where they live. 
So we have pockets of methane that can be released by a small disturbance. But to produce a flame, there needs to be an ignition source. As it happens, there are a couple of sources that could ignite these pockets of gas. The little fellows producing the methane can also produce another gas called phosphine. This gas just happens to react with oxygen and produces enough heat to ignite the pockets of methane gas. The flame burns with an eerie blue light tinged with yellow. A sudden burst of light will be there for a few seconds until all the methane has been burnt off, thus giving rise to the lantern men tails. I did mention a couple of ignition sources, the other one being people themselves. Many of the tales tell of lantern men appearing when the light comes near, knocking the lantern or candle out of the person's hand. In fact, one of the warnings tells you not to carry a light as it attracts them. Once again, it's simple science. Lanterns and candles provide a source of ignition for the methane gas. A person walking across the marsh could disturb the methane pocket. The light they are carrying then ignites the gas, producing an explosion that knocks the light out of the person's hand. A big enough pocket of gas could produce an explosion that could knock someone over or stun them, falling into the murky waters to drown. There are many classic examples of this ignition source on YouTube. They involve individuals setting farts alight. So if you want to see the effect in action, you could search for a few. We do, however, advise not to undertake this experiment yourself as blowback can be very dangerous. So, why do we not get so many reports of these mysterious lights anymore? It's quite simple really. We have drained a lot of our marshland to use for farming, putting paid to the murky waters and the production of methane pockets. You can still witness these ghost lights in some marshland areas if you're willing to hang about long enough. So, let's leave you all with a final version of the elusive Lantern Man story. An Irish version of the tale has a never-do-well named Drunk Jack or Stingy Jack, who, when the devil comes to collect his soul, invites him to have a last drink with him. True to his name, Stingy Jack didn't want to pay for his drink, so he convinced the devil to turn himself into a coin that Jack could use to buy their drinks. Once the devil did so, Jack decided to keep the money and put it in his pocket next to a silver cross, which prevented the devil from changing back into his original form. Jack eventually freed the devil under the condition that he would not bother Jack for one year, and that should Jack die, he would not claim his soul. The next year, when the devil returned, Jack once again tricked the devil into climbing into a tree to pick a piece of fruit for him. While he was up the tree, Jack carved the sign of the cross into the tree's bark so the devil could not come back down. Jack made him promise not to bother him for 10 more years and upon agreeing the terms, the devil was released. Soon after this, Jack sadly died. As the legend goes, God would not allow such a devious and sinful man into heaven. So down he went. But the devil, upset by the trick Jack played on him and keeping his word not to claim his soul, would not allow Jack into hell. Instead, he sent Jack off into the dark night with only a burning coal to light his way. Jack put the coal into a carved out turnip and has been roaming the earth with his homemade lantern ever since. The Irish began to refer to this ghostly figure as Jack of the Lantern, then simply Jack O'Lantern. In Ireland, people began to make their own version of Jack's lanterns by hollowing out a large swede or beet and carving scary faces into them. Placing a candle inside, they placed them in windows or near doors when the veil between the worlds grows thin to frighten away stingy Jack and other wandering evil spirits. A tradition taken by Irish immigrants to America who began to use pumpkins to make these lanterns instead. 
every Halloween. These lanterns are lit to keep the spirits at bay, a lasting legacy to the lantern men tales. Okay, I admit the last story was a bit of a tenuous link to the Lantern Men, but it was a great tale and I had to tell it. What you should do now, I think, is to go and look about your own local area, because I'm pretty certain you will find your own version of the Lantern Men, especially if you live in areas where there is a marsh or bog or land like that that could produce these pockets of methane gas. So, that's my little tale for this podcast. All done and dusted. I really hope you enjoyed it. Before I say goodbye, I have a little request. If you enjoy the content of our podcast channel, or perhaps you may think we're just a little bit rubbish, could we ask you, if you feel comfortable doing so, to leave us a review on your podcast provider. It helps us to see what people think, and yes, it also helps our channel get noticed. We love to see what you think. Of course, you don't have to write anything. You can just give us a star rating instead, good or bad. We don't mind. All feedback is very useful to us. So, thank you once again for listening. I hope you enjoyed my tale. And thank you for supporting our channel. Until next time, goodbye. I'm going to go to the next one.